an amazing instrument and has developed into an incredible voice in today's music. So many types of guitars, so many styles of playing, all sorts of gear. How does one make their voice be heard as a guitarist? My name is Jeff Floro and welcome to All About Guitar, where we talk tone, we talk technique, we talk gear. Where we discover how we can become better musicians in a world of constantly changing technologies. Where we take a good look at everything guitar. And sometimes not exactly guitar, but just as important. So we can be more successful as a musician in today's music scene. So sit back and relax, and let's explore all about guitar. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to All About Guitar. We have a great show for you tonight. And uh, we're going to talk about a very unusual instrument, but it's becoming more prominent, especially in uh, TV and film scores. Uh, my guest I want to welcome to the show. Uh, he's been here before, but this is the first time we're actually going to talk about what he, what he makes and what he loves to play. Uh, Jonathan Wilson from Togaman Guitar Viols. Uh, Jonathan, welcome so much for coming on the show. And thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. It's really a pleasure. And um, I've seen uh, these instruments, and we've talked about this before. He's uh, He's been at several of the of Lonnie's LA Amp shows, and it's a fascinating instrument. So um, one of the things I want to do is talk about the development, because it's an unusual, very unusual instrument. But uh, uh, as I understand correctly, it evolved from the viola da gamba, if I'm correct. Well, um you could say it's related to the viola da gamba. It's in a, in a lot of ways, it's uh, quite similar. Um, my own arrival at it, though, was a little bit of a different uh, road. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, I'd say about uh, it goes back. I mean, almost forty years. Oh my God, um, I was in boarding school and uh, was really into uh, guitar, of course, as a kid and. Um, I had uh, read about this uh, thing called the Gizmatron, which I believe is out on the market again. It was a little thing that did hurdy-gurdy wheels uh, mm -hmm. on an electric guitar. And uh, it had me thinking about it a lot. And then I got interested in violin music and trying to emulate those sounds. So I was doing a lot of this uh, Stratocaster volume knob kind of stuff. And uh, I had a teacher in boarding school named Ron McFarlane, whose son is Seth McFarlane, actually. Mm -hmm. Um, and I used to play in the you know, chorus doing all that sound and basically um, he said oh you sound more like a cellist than a guitar player so I think I took it literally and um, I think by about 89 so this was going back to 8084 and then by 89 I found out I read about the arpeggioni as I was I had this concept in my mind of exactly what I wanted and I didn't know it really actually existed before and so I just uh, hit the ceiling uh, when I, uh, you know, uh, read about this little tiny paragraph in a very long article in Encyclopedia Britannica in 1948. Um, it was in uh, one winter in uh, Connecticut. And uh, so I was, uh, I was it. That was it. I was from 1989 forward. I was like, I, it's arpeggioni or bust. And so I had a rough uh, little start in the early 90s with it. Um, and uh you know i had a prototype through all those years and i played it it was not built by me though and so there was some little things i wanted to change about it and i think by the time y2k came around i, I found out that i could probably communicate with my brain to my hands a little more directly and so i guess i became a luthier at some point along the road well how did you discover the arpeggio well, that was the, the discovery was that I was actually studying the encyclopedia I was talking about, about violins, because I wanted to learn everything I could about violins so that I can make my violin guitar really good, you know, or at least what I would hope to be. And I was very, uh, like I said, it was a very long read, but then there was this little article, that, uh, this little paragraph that, that described a six string cello tuned like a guitar fretted with 24 frets made by Johann Stouffer in 1823. 
And I just was like, oh man, that was like, that was it for me. So I didn't actually have an, a physical encounter with it. I'd never even seen a picture of one for quite a while, but I knew I wanted an arpeggione. So I created what I interpreted to be an arpeggione, which was essentially, now the earlier uh, version was a 25 and a half inch scale, just like a guitar. And that was a little bit unwieldy to play actually. <clears throat> I mean, a 25 and a half inch scale Stratocaster feels great in my hands. But for this purpose and actually, you know, Boeing and um, I, I shortened it down to uh, uh, when I got uh, to the early Y2Ks, I redesigned it. And I, um, one day I was uh, working um, at the time at Castle's Music and I grabbed a viola off the wall and it was a 16 inch scale. And I just started playing it the way I would my arpeggioni. And I'm going, you know what, maybe I should like revisit the scale length thing because this is a lot more comfortable. So I shot between the 16 inch, 16 and a half inch and the 25 and a half inch scale came to uh, 21, which it turns out that's a, um, that's a, a basically a quarter size cello scale. And um, anyway, I, I made it such that the, um, uh, the nut is a roughly eye level. So I'm not like reaching up here to play a low F or whatever. This thing is tuned by the way. Um, actually I have it in a drop D, but it would be normally EAD, you know, the same tuning. So if I play that D chord, we get that. So, um, yeah. Now the, the, okay. So let's talk a little bit cause you obviously spent some time, uh, developing the ergonomics of the instrument. Um, you might want to hold it up because I noticed that you have a stand on it. Well, it this a is stand. a leg peg. Okay. And uh, really, I have, a, it's, this one's fairly short. Sometimes I make it a little longer. But really, it's meant to wrap the right leg around. And then in this Oh, okay, so it's not meant to stand here, on there. My earlier electrics had a low, lower curve here, so I kind of kept it. Um, because the acoustics, um, they don't weigh themselves down like an electric does. And so, if, you know, the thing is like really all over the place. Now, viola de gambas, they, they typically play them between the legs like this. And with an upward, you know, like uh, palm up bow grip. Right. And um, I really, I like the sound of it better when it's not that way. Um, but also too, I was really trying to approach it like a guitar player. And it's sort of like a, I know most people think Jimmy Page and it, Jimmy Page, as much as I've been influenced by him as a guitar player, I never really connected him to the bowed guitar thing until later. Um, and it was sort of like, you know, the sort of under, sort of an un, palm up underhand grip on the bow. And we're able to, uh, you know, have a fairly relaxed, uh, you know, stance with it. <laughs> So, um, and there's other things about the bow that I can talk about too, but uh, really it just had, I designed this for how I play it, not how, you know, any musicologist or violin teacher, you know, they, they all told me I was wrong in how I played this instrument and how dare I play it that way. Uh, and it turned out that uh, from an old painting uh, from, uh, it's a Palo Veronese painting uh, which depicts the uh, water to wine scene in the Bible. Of course, they're all wearing togas. And so I call it Toga Man because it was actually the painter himself was the guy with the toga playing oh, really? in, you know, in a similar stance. And so that was my smoking gun. That was my way of saying, hey, this was going on for centuries before you guys even were making... Um... You know, it's funny, the violin and cello family grew up sort of separately and in parallel. The early... Um, Viola de Gambas or Viola de Gambas depends on what side of the Rockies you're on or whatever how we pronounce it I guess. Um, basically, uh, they uh, the Spain was the birthplace of the guitar, and you had vihuelas and you had lutes, um, and the Moroccans brought their bows over the, uh, the Strait of Gibraltar, and when they invaded Spain, they took the bows with them. It was sort of a Reese's peanut butter cup thing where the you know the chocolate landed in the peanut butter or whatever and they just said hey this is really cool you know they were taking their lutes and their um and 
they were like, hey, that's pretty cool. Let's keep that. So they they started make, building them that way. And so it's, it, originally, it's even be the the origins of the viola da gamba is the vihuela. Yeah, and they had they had um, two different vihuelas. They had uh, vihuela de mano and vihuela de arco. And the de mano was plucked, so you 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 know plucked and then of course uh, the arco you had the bow and um, which I think is pretty cool it kind of gives a real more colorful history that most people don't know about the guitar or you know its variants and right. so this is quite literally the Jimmy Page thing happened well over five centuries ago and, or even more there was you know I mean they're, they're very similar to what um, in the Middle East they were playing uh, rabobs and uh, certain other instruments that were bowed and they were you know even in Asia you have these sort of uh, they're really cool I've seen them on YouTube they're like these two string bowed lutes air who air who's air who's are another one that's um <clears throat> That has the sort of the skin head, uh, you know, like a banjo. But the thing is, is one one thing about the air who is really interesting is it shows the directionality of the bowing because um, really the when you bow a string, it follows the uh, direction of the bow. So if you go to an electric guitar and you bow it, it's really like weak because the planar motion of the of the uh, string is such that. Um, it's not really going to move the top, and especially if the, if the string is low down at the top, the string is essentially traveling in the same direction as the top is. So uh, when you have a taller bridge, you have a sound post underneath the treble foot, yeah. and that acts like a hinge, like sort of a um, kind of a door hinge in a way. And when you actually bow it, it takes the bass side and pumps the bass bar side, and it's a sort of a pumping action that happens. Well, that's why. Uh, Jimmy Page did it mostly on the Les Paul because the yeah. neck's angled. True, the, you know, on his telly it was much more difficult because it was right, flat. right. And then and also, <laughs> you know, and the problem is the magnetic pickups um, or any pickups really. But uh, that's a good example is that the flux field um, it, you're giving it, you're kind of putting it in the plane of rejection, so it's really weak. So what happens is you'd bow the string, and then it would like get loud as soon as you remove the bow. Yeah. But it would be much quieter. So you had to put like a disproportionate amount of gain to get anything out of it. And it was a you know, hot mess when you actually did pull the bow away from it. Which you can see in a lot of those Zeppelin uh, uh, videos of Page bowing. And interestingly enough, there's a guy uh, before Page uh, named Eddie Phillips from The Creation. And uh, he was... Uh, in the same you know studios and um, and they had a they had a couple little hits uh, painter man and uh, making time uh, where they were he was bowing his 335 and uh, I talked to Eddie uh, several years ago he called me up because he says hey thanks for getting the story right on your website and uh, basically he said um, that they were they would often be in the same studios and so somebody would leave a violin bow and so one of these you know 60s guitar players would go oh cool all right let's make some noise and so the bow kind of got kicked around and i think that's where the origins for both eddie and both um mm -hmm. jimmy page uh, came from at, at least that's what um, um eddie's account of it is now let me ask you what's the um the radius of that fretboard well, um, in the early days, I had something that was a little, little less <laughs> less intense. It was about a two and a half inch radius at the bridge, and it was roughly seven ish, seven and a half ish, um, kind of like a old Fender. And um, basically, this is more of an ellipse. It's a lot steeper on the uh, on the bass side. And so when I designed the fingerboard, I, I had to start over because I was, you know, getting frustrated with the limitations of the other boards because you couldn't really, you know, the, the problem is, is that the higher strings are more taut and the lower strings are a little more. So when you press the bow, you could, you know, inadvertently hit the neighboring strings instead. So you have to steepen it up a little bit to compensate for the tension difference. And... What I did was I uh, created a, an optimal bridge first, 
and then um, I, once I was happy with the string separation, then I designed the fingerboard around that curve. Um, hold up the guitar so I can see the they can see the bridge, because it's yeah it's it's kind of lopsided. If you let me get a picture of it and then just show it towards the other camera here. Hold on a second. Let me just get a good shot of that. Just hold it right here. Let me. So if you take a look, you can see it dips more here, and it's it's a milder curve here. It's kind of going this way, and it leans in a little bit this way. Thank you. Okay. And what's that fretboard made out of? That's a uh, composite. Uh, it's got a carbon uh, graphite mixture in it. Um, and it basically has carbon fiber inside of it. Um, it's kind of a layup. It's a whole kind of we, we mold the shell and then there's a vacuum. Um, we put a sort of a vacuum clamp on the back of it with the uh, wet carbon fiber on the back of it with the resin. And then so it, it, it cures and then we, you know, hit it to the belt sander and then. Now, what about the frets? Are those? That's all, all one piece. So it's carb. It's all the fretboard. It's it's everything about it is one piece outside of that. Yeah, including the nut. So everything is, um, you think about like when, um, and the, the advantage to it, by the way, is it dramatically makes it more scuff resistant. So in, in fact, see, um, the, my earlier fingerboards were metal frets. And they were great when, you, when we were using guitar <laughs> strings like uh, flat wound strings. Uh, jazz flats like Diodario chromes or anything similar to that. And that's the sound you hear in a lot of these uh, movies from the 2000s, like um, 300 and uh, a lot of things that Tyler Bates has done. Um, and that was a, a good combo for, for that, but it was the, the thing was that they're poor bowed strings, actually. Guitar strings, uh, when you lean into them too hard with a bow, it pulls them sharp. So I really started going over to, um, I think about 2010-ish, we started going to these uh, cello strings. And I had a couple clients in the Palisades who were, we were kind of A-being them, you know, with different brands and stuff like that. So we found out the uh, Diodario Helicores were really our best uh, sounding ones. And so I went to that, and then I redesigned the bridge to the strings and I redesigned the fingerboard. Um, for a while we were making like uh, the fingerboards with a CNC in, in the rough and then I would, I would hand polish it out and put the frets in uh, like a jewelry wire. But the problem is it would chew the strings right up. So now these strings are about maybe $150, $160 a set. Whoa. Okay, this is not like going to Guitar Center and buying a little, you know, set of slinkies or something. So um, that was problematic. So when people were going through their high E strings, like, you know, it would just basically eat them for lunch. Uh, I really got to the point where I said, regardless of tradition, regardless of materials, regardless of bias, you know, is it ebony, is it this or whatever? I just said, what would the ultimate playing surface really be like? Mm -hmm. And so I imagined it being really a very low friction um, so we can kind of wiggle the strings of it with no noise on it. And the other thing that I found that these, these fingerboards do better is the wooden boards, sometimes you'd have hot spots on them. So in other words, you would have some notes louder than the other. And that was uh, also a problem. So this sort of flattened out the EQ a little bit, and it was nice in the studios because, and by the way, 99% of these go right into a studio. Um, and they get under mic so you can hear all every little thing about them. So if we're actually, you know, wiggling, I don't get the real finger noise as much. You know, it's very much more quieter than the wood. You'd hear your finger, hand on the wood and, you know, of course you'd hear the steel frit, you know, rubbing the metal to metal like really badly. So this has really worked out very well and I'm quite proud of them actually. How, how long do the strings last? You know, they can be on there depending on how, I mean, you know, this, these, these have been on for over a year and they're still fine. So that's the good news. The bad news is they're expensive. The good news is they stay on a lot longer. And, and especially, now with this setup, they, they, you don't get too many breakage. 
No, no, not I haven't I haven't broken any at all ever myself. Now let's talk a little bit. What's uh, the the fretboard's this composite? What's the neck made out of? This particular neck's maple. Um, a lot of the uh, stock models that I'm making, though, um, I'm, uh, it surprises people. I use alder for the necks because I like the lighter sound. It's give, it gives it a little more bloom in it. Uh, the bodies are typically, um, nowadays, they're what violins would, or guitars would be uh, made of, but uh, maple back and sides um, using a Lutz spruce, which is sort of a, a hybrid of um, Engelman and uh, Sitka. I found that combo to be pretty nice, so I've been sticking with the uh, Lutz. Go and ahead and, and turn turn it around, and I want to show the fretboard. I'm going to try to get. The, you want to see the fretboard? Uh, I mean the uh, the neck on the back, so they can see it a little bit. Now, are those locking uh, geared nut uh, tuning keys or just like regular? Yes, they're oh, actually. Oh, um, flip it around and get the back wood. Oh, um, wow, that's beautiful. Yeah, they're. Uh, they're basically uh, they're they're vintners um, from Germany, and uh, they're uh, they're planetary gears. So they're they're not they look like friction pegs, but in, in fact they they're geared. So we can get it really dialed in. And uh, for a while, I was doing like a three and three combo with like I was using everything from Spurzels, and then eventually I went to um, Planet Waves locking tuners and the trim locks and then of course people would be terrorized because those things would like you know chop the strings and they don't know they're chopping the strings and so um i, I like this it's a much more cleaner assembly and uh but they're pretty they're pretty accurate they're you can yeah fine -tune. they're 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 you know really uh quite dead on yeah now with the bridge uh how do you know where the bridge goes if like let's say you're changing the strings is it well uh the best practice really is once the thing's set up um, and you are changing the strings, just change one at a time under tension. Oh, okay. And then that way you don't have to go through all the setup and does you don't worry about the... Does that move a lot um, or does it, is it pretty... It stiff? can a little bit over time. I mean, things can inadvertently bump it, but um, also too, just the time it settles in and gets tuned and retuned, it can kind of... And I have to go through a whole lecture on how to, you know, move it around and get it, get it just right. But basically... Like a guitar, it's going to be pretty much, you know, what this uh, length is to the 12th fret, the 12th to that is going to be pretty much, you know, uh, where it's going to be. Now, the, some people do see that it's a little wavy and it's potato chippy looking, and that's because it's hand carved to be compensated. So when I actually set this thing up, I'm using a dummy bridge that is adjustable. Okay. Now, the adjustable bridges sound horrible. The more, more moving parts you put on a bridge, the uh, worse it just sounds. But it gets it in tune, and so then I can copy that pattern, and then I carve, I carve the bridge to that pattern. So that's the other caveat is uh, you have to stick to the same brand of strings and same tensions that I uh, issue it with. I mean, you can experiment, but you might throw that off a little bit. So if you want to change strings, you have to have a new bridge. Well... If it's really like something that's really badly wonky, then yeah. Um, I've had people put uh, B to B tuning and change their strings, and it's pretty close. It's, you know, they can kind of work with it. Um, but I like to set it up to the tuning that it's going to be in because, you know, we can be a little more precise that way. Now, where is the pickup? The pickup is a, um, it's right on the bass bar. It's kind of, I don't know if you can see that inside. Oh, it's a, it's a contact pickup. Well, what it is, it's a um, LR Bags Lyric pickup, which is a hybrid of kind of a mic and a pickup. And typically, I don't know if you've ever been familiar with like the sound of what a mic sounds like in, a, in an acoustic guitar, but generally it's pretty horrible. So that's the what was that? What was the name of that pickup? It's the uh, uh, LR Bags Lyric. Lyric. And what I do is I have it phantom powered through this uh, EMG box here. So there's a, it's, it is an active pickup, but there's no battery inside the instrument. So we're just sending, like this cable's a TRS cable. So a stereo cable going to the box to the instrument. So I've kind of modified the uh, thing at the board such that we can send the positive up the ring. So this Lyric pickup, is it like, you know, um, LR Bags makes a dual pickup system where there's a, Pizza so, right. and the con the uh, microphone one is that the microphone one? Yes, this is the microphone contact pickup, um, and so it's right under the base foot of the bridge. It's right directly on the uh, 
sound, the bass bar actually. So it gets a pretty nice um, representation of the sound, and plus it's right, it's on the business part of where the, you know, the bridge is really kind of moving. So uh, I never liked the piezo pickups, um, and in fact, most violin and, and cello pickups I've ever heard are just to me they're horrible and a lot of my customers feel the same way we've been very very happy with this and the thing is is that these were designed for acoustic guitars uh, so they weren't really they didn't have me in mind when they designed it but um, I tried it I used to use everything from K&K's to whatever and they were good for you know contact pickups but these the lyric is just a lot more real sounding and well it seems that it has a, it has enough top end yeah. Uh, that's usually why you want the uh, piezo just to get a little, get the brighter and then get the girth from the other. Part. Right. Um, and sometimes though, I found that, um, you know, you, it'd be like rubbing your nails on chalk though, the kind of sound you'd get. It mm -hmm. would just sort of, um, and what, a, what you'd wind up doing is electronically trying to, you know, EQ it. And. This thing it comes nice pretty much right out of the box. Well, it sounds, it has plenty of top end. It seems like it does. And Yeah, and you can, um, there is a little adjustment on this thing. It's like a little tiny Phillips kind of screw, and you set it and forget it, and you just kind of do it to your rig. It's There's a little flywheel right there on the, um, and uh, it, uh, you know, it's a presence control, I guess. It's you know the, how they used to say that on the Marshall amps. It was sort of a marketing term for just another, yeah. you know. But um, you know, set it and forget it. So if it's if it's a little too bright or too dark, you can kind of go either way, and you just dial it in that way. Um, I'm very happy with it. Um, I regularly put these in, and a lot of my clients they just plug them straight in to Pro Tools. Uh, some t because a lot of these guys working in TV and film, they don't want to have to sit there and move mics around all day to you know get a quick cue. They're they're dealing with a schedule where it's like I need that thing in like less than twenty minutes for a network show. Bam, mm -hmm. make it happen. So that works out pretty well. But also, I found that working with the pickup and a good mic in front of it, the the sound of the two is just wonderful. And if you hard pan them, it's kind of magical too. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, again, at the end of the day, these, these instruments are sort of, uh, I guess they're tools, you know. Yeah. For... Now, um, I'm going to ask you a little bit about the bracing of that. But before that, is there any TV shows that you know of that we can listen to that would have this that you that are easy to check out? Yeah, I would say there's um, Kevin Kiner. Uh, does a lot of he's done everything from uh, well with my older instruments he's done like CSI Miami to uh, all the way up to there's a um, there was something on Netflix called uh, Making a Murderer that it appeared in quite a lot he used it plucked there too a lot um, there's uh, a, a current show on uh, I believe it's I can't remember is it Showtime or HBO I think it's Showtime it's um, a City on a Hill and uh, oh well, let's say the here's the big one. How about Game of Thrones for Game so many Thrones. seasons? That's been like what eight or nine seasons. I don't remember what it was. Now the one thing I want to clear up is the opening theme is not the instrument, but uh, a lot of the other stuff he does in there is. Mm -hmm. Of course, he's not that public about that because you know <laughs> these uh, people in these you know unions or whatever. I don't know, but. Well, I mean, the uh, I would assume you're still a guitarist when you play this. It's yes, the, um, that's the thing is that because you know our points of reference are all the same, all our har points of harmony are pretty much the same. I could take you know, like I said, I'm just taking that little D chord there, but we can. So it. Um... How many strings can you bow at the same time to do like chords? You know, um, I would say two or three, um, even though you can, of course, like the name Arpeggioni, probably from that old one that Stouffer built a long, long time ago. Um, it might have been called the Arpeggioni just because you could do arpeggio so well with it. <laughs> So the arpeggioni was really curved too. 
Yeah, I mean, it was, it, you have to, uh, to be able to make it a bowed instrument where you can, the idea is that if you want to bow an individual string, you can, but to do that, you have to have a certain arcuate curvature. Right. And it needs to harmonize with the fingerboard, though, so there's a lot of, there's a lot of detail in the geometry. Yeah, no, so there, you can, it's probably more common to do a double stop on there than to do a triple. Well, you know, I, I sometimes I'm not really warmed up, and honestly, I haven't been practicing much. So there's some thirds there. Um, but yeah, you can, um, and the other thing is, too, uh, that I think that a lot of people uh, think, they think, well, it's fretted, so you're limited. You're just going to have static notes or whatever. And that's not the, that's not the case. Uh, you could be fretless at will. So in other words, if we want to be... Or, yeah, so if I press down, I can get that chromatic rush. Or, so basically we can, and you can learn, you can kind of, with practice, you can take like a thirds, for example, and you can learn how to kind of do that. It's, I would say it's, again, it's like playing slide with your fingertips. Right. So you're not you're not pushing the string all the way down to where it's going you know, to engage with the fret or the stopping point I like to call it, um, but when it, when you want that's the beauty of it too because you could do a phrase where you're you know involving a lot of techniques in just one little pass you mm -hmm. know you could be doing. <laughs> Now, I was going to just ask you, and you just did it for me. You bend the string like a guitar player. Sure. But yeah. you don't roll your, for vibrato, you don't roll your... Well, you can, though. I, I suck at the roll thing, so I kind of have to go... I kind of do it like more of a slide guitar. I have clients who are really good at the roll thing, and so they kind of go right on top of the fret, um, I'm still kind of a guitar player, so it's like I kind of go right, you know, right before the fret. Um, some people like uh, will maybe hit a point like a little too far back, and what happens is the the string will actually miss the fret because it's going like remember that planar motion I was describing. Suddenly, it's passing over it and creating another stopping point. So that can be a little, uh, you know, the. the they're great when you need those little like clean chords and things like that and but you're not limited to that you can you can do a rock star vibrato on it or you could do a classical style vibrato on it so mm -hmm. you're not you've got the whole rainbow now is it hard to do like in violin and cello to do the harmonics to do bow a harmonic like from the i know you can't do it for the lower register because it's too wide because you have to you do mean, it from Oh, you mean like uh, spreading a finger distance or something? To hit the, and, yeah, to get the harmonic. Well, but, you know, a lot of these harmonics that we know are going to come right out. Oh, you can do it like that. You don't have to, you don't have to tap it. So you can, so you can hear all of them, all of them. So you're just lightly touching the string. Right. So in tone. other words, instead of actually, right, instead of pushing it down to where it's going to create a stopping point, it's just that light touch that you do normally, like, you know, when you're tuning a guitar, you know, when you're hitting harmonics and, right? So um, another thing that's pretty cool is you could like go, I'm going to take, for example, um, on the B string, I'm going to go to the fifth fret and I'm going to go up an octave where that is and now if we take the bow and bow right over that it sounds like a flute weird and if we do that with maybe something like here's like a little a chord bard You know, there's these, all these little sounds. The one, uh, I think one of the things that appeals to uh, film composers about this instrument 
is that it's also a sound design tool. Right, right. You know, you can. You can I mean, just, it's amazing that you're getting that kind of a. You can just do all kinds of crazy, you know, things with it. Well, that going down when you were going down the uh, uh, the harmonics and you. Were, Yeah, I mean it's uh, you know you get all the natural harmonics out of out of it. What's really curious, I don't know. Sometimes I can I can do it, and sometimes I can't. But it's almost weird that you you find like a a dominant seventh in there somewhere. Mm, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it doesn't make sense that it would do that. I can't do it right now. I'm I'm on too on the spot to do that. But now the. Tell me a little bit about the top, how it's braced. Well, it's um, like a violin. It has a bass bar that goes right directly under the bass foot of the bridge. And in the um, underneath the treble side, you have a, a sound post that's in there. So that's actually holding the top up on that side. The bass side's kind of held up by the bass bar on the other side. So there's really, really just... That's the that's the entirety of the bracing. There's the no top. other like right. bar, like a fan right. bracing or like a typical. Guitar. No, the pro, you know what my first acoustic, um, which Kevin Kiner now has, uh, it actually did have sort of an X braceish kind of top, and we were trying to make it like an acoustic top. It, the problem was that impeded the the actual movement that is associated with. Um, like I was saying earlier, it's kind of like the gingerbread man with one foot um, hinged on where the sound post is, and it, it's rocking that bass bar up and down as a pumping motion. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so, you know, it was funny. It was like if you uh, look up guys like Lloyd Lohr, Lohr who um, was an absolute genius, who was the guy at Gibson a long time ago. Um, he didn't fit into that corporate culture. <laughs> Um, but he did some lectures and we're, um, I think, uh, Roger Simonoff has a couple of his books of his lectures that some girl at the time took very great notes and it's like literally a book. And it was kind of through studying some of Lore's work that I realized that that X bracing was completely not working. Now, what happened was it, uh, that one got smashed in DHL, the, uh, top did. So I said, Hey, while I'm at it, let me redesign the top. And uh, so I made the first prototype. We call it Old Faithful. And if you go on some of my old, uh, like from maybe 10 or 12 years ago, uh, some of the old uh, YouTube videos of the, of the day, you can see Old Faithful on there. And there was a first, uh, I took just some horrible piece of pine. I was just testing the, the design and it just stayed on the instrument. Uh, Kevin liked the way the thing sounded. And so we... Because uh, that's not that curved of a finger... Uh, uh, Top. It's not curved. It's this particular flat. one's not as much. I would say the other ones we do kind of are. We kind of compression uh, bend them. And they're partially carved and partially bent. This, uh, I don't really let this particular one out of the shop. It's The bridge is a little higher than I normally like to go. So sometimes the, somehow the next set when we were doing it didn't. Uh, um, it, but it lives around for a, as, a, as a demo model. But generally when I have the right amount of tension, it really doesn't seem to settle that much. Uh, in fact, we've changed the way a lot of our architecture is. This neck, for example, the block that's inside is the same piece of wood. So it's not a glued to a block. It's not glued to a dovetail. Oh, it's, it's, and so we actually put it into a jig that's perfectly aligned and we get the right, you know, in this case, I don't know, something must have slipped that day. But um, generally we get them perfectly dead center and we get them, uh, you know, get the exact, um, you know, uh, basically a pitch of the, of the neck to get the bridge at the desired height. And that's been working out very well. And this is um, what I call a Spanish... Uh, fox uh, neck joint and the reason I'm calling it is because on the bass side it's like a Spanish guitar that's where it's more of a saw curve in and we just tuck the skin into there instead of you know making it like and then on the other side it's a twisted cutaway where it's like literally right on the um, on second, okay. and turn, turn it a little more like that there we go and so basically, uh, that was inspired by uh, the work um, 
There's a very talented uh, uh, luthier uh, from Switzerland I met at the Florida show many years ago named uh, Lucas Brunner. And so I contacted Lucas and I said, I, I kind of, I'm sort of ripping your idea off. Are you cool with me calling it the Brunner cutaway? He says, don't worry, I stole it from Charles Fox. Nah. So I call it the Spanish Fox uh, neck joint. Spanish Fox neck joint. <laughs> that's funny. Uh, that's interesting that the, uh, um, so you have, you have a lot of option. You don't have to have it angled that much because that's a pretty big bridge. Have you tried them where they're a little lower? Well, what not, happens? Not the action, but I mean. What happens, the bridge, If you the lower you get, the weaker the sound is. Oh, really? Okay. And so, but then again, you can have it too, too high and you can be putting too much pressure on it. This one's kind of uh, sort of acting like that a little bit. Um, but again, this was sort of a prototype. We were trying the new uh, Stouffer heads uh, and we've kind of tuned them in since then a lot more. But um any problems with the the top uh, warping from that? No, I mean I haven't. Once they settle in, they just kind of stay there. Now I've had somebody uh, leave one in a sunroom and direct sunlight, and it would do all kinds of horrible stuff. And they live right near the ocean, so it's like, you know, there's some things you really can't do. Now uh, I should mention that I'm working on a series of uh, composite builds made out of carbon fiber. But I'm also migrating into things like flax and hemp. Uh, now those aren't ready for prime time yet, but uh, I'm working on them. Mm -hmm. And uh, that I'm, way they can take any weather. I'm curious if you anybody's asked you to make this type of instrument as a bass. I, I get that a lot. Um, my biggest problem is I've always had a backlog of this particular thing to where the bandwidth it takes to me, for me to go in and engineer another instrument I've had also had requests for seven strings, uh, but then again, now see that we're using modern strings, which have a very much uh, higher tension um, to get the desired sound we're after. Um, but uh, you know, I ha again, I'd have to revisit the whole architecture. I'd have to make a new fingerboard. I'd have to retool it, and the time out is just too killer to yeah. do it. Um, Especially when I've got a, you know, I've in the past I've had anywhere from a year to a, a year and a half. Nowadays, we generally turn these things around within a few months with our current, uh, you know, status. But uh, mostly, a lot of people have waited like nine months or more to get. Uh, not that it takes that long to build the instrument itself; it just takes that long to get through the queue. And um, we're a very small firm. My uh, son works with me now, um, and so. You know, just a couple of us, uh, you know, m making a lot of uh, sawdust. and um, So there is a waiting list for these? Typically, yeah. But, I mean, right now, I think in, you know, as of the last uh, so many months, we've kind of caught up a little bit. So we're, we're kind of at the point where, well, unless, you know, anything changes and we get inundated with a bunch of new orders. I always tell people, it's like, whatever I tell you today could be not true tomorrow morning mm -hmm, if mm -hmm. a few people call me and place an order. Um, and generally, we just build them in project rounds. So it's not the whole, you know, thing up. Uh, and I'd say, you know, uh, one third of our business is California. One, the other third is the lower 48. And the other third is international. Um, Europe and Asia and Australia, Canada. So, uh, the, you know, it's, it's international. Mm -hmm. Oh, definitely. It's yeah. a great answer. I mean, it, it's really versatile. Well, and you. also, too, plucking it, it's, it has a, a, not as, as much of a sustain. You, I mean, you're, you're sustaining that, but I mean, like, if you're doing like a bass line, doom, 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 it's almost like a plucking, uh, like a cello, but it has right. a little more attack than like in a classical guitar or flamenco guitar. Yeah, it's sort of a sort of somewhere between a pizzicato, viola, yeah. cello, and maybe almost a harpy classical guitar, but sort of morphed in there. And like I said, a lot of the uh, composers who've been using these use the plucked side of it uh, just to get that different, you know, kind of sound. Um, I can see you doubling that with a guitar. Yeah, yeah, right. It's a different. It's not going to have the same kind of you know attack or ring as a you know. It's not going to have that kind of thing like a like a martin 
D35 well, no, or something like that or a Les Paul or a whatever. But um, it, it is definitely its own thing. We chose these um, Diodario helicores because uh, I think it was they were designed by Ned Steinberger for his, his instruments. And they have a little bit more of a pluck ring to them than typical uh, violin and cello strings do. Uh, but they also, what I like about them a lot is they have a fast bow attack, which is uh, nice when you're, especially doing all those like kind of arpeggios and it's got a really nice grip on the, on them. So, um, and there is a difference. It's like, you know, when you go to try the uh, inexpensive student cello strings, it's just night and day. Yeah. Well, we're already out of time. I told you we'd go by fast. Uh, the website to check all this out is togamanguitars.com. And he's got some interesting, he talks a little more about the history of it. And you can see more what he's talking about and the options that are available. <coughs> um, do you want to go ahead and just, you were doing something with the looper a little bit before the show. Do you want to take us out with a little bit of a... I'll try. I might fall apart here, but... <laughs> well, just at least give him an right. idea um, of the potential. I mean, sonically... This is an interesting instrument to have in your arsenal, especially for studio work. I'm waiting to see somebody out there use it live because it does have its points. you again for coming and uh i love this instrument it's great i gotta start saving up for one everybody thank you so much uh we will see you next week have a great week and uh, we will talk with you later take care bye-bye <laughs>